Good evening, and welcome to the Finance Subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee, February, I mean February, March 9th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Um, so first, uh, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily relieving, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 20. Pursuant to the order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting law's requirement that meetings be held in public places open and physically accessible to the public, so long as alternative measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative meetings. <clears throat> This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube, and Comcast Channel 98. The public can access this meeting via this link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton Channels. All right, first I'll call the roll to establish a quorum. Let's see. The mayor has not arrived yet. Uh, D'Agostino is a yes or here. Ms. Asak. Here. Mrs. Mendez. Here. Okay. Mr. Minicello. Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah. All right. Mrs. Sullivan did call and, and, and let me know she wouldn't be able to join us. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah. Okay. We have our quorum with, with two members joining us via Zoom and uh, three present in the room. Um, our first order of business is the lease of general warehouse space. Uh, Mr. Petronio, I assume you'll be taking the lead on that issue. All right, the floor is yours. So we had put a bid out for um, warehouse space with some office space for lease for the school system. Um, part of it is for our regular supplies and whatnot, and the rest of it would be um, the fact that we're looking to enter into the school bus, um, the ownership of school bus, so we need a place to work out of. So we put a bid out for approximately 50,000 uh, square feet of warehouse space. I think the bid was for anything over 40,000, and we'd evaluate what we got. We received one bid in because we were looking for a warehouse space that's also located in the city that can um, be convenient to access for, for school buses, you know, off on, on a main route. So we received one bid from uh, Casey Brothers for a location up on Pearl Street that is just past White's Bakery, uh, used to be the Farm America building. Um, it's, a, it's a real warehouse, you know, there's 24 foot high ceilings, it's wide open, uh, there's some office space on the first floor and there's actually some office space on the second floor um, on that building. They came back with a, a uh, RF with a quote with a price of 850 a square foot plus triple net. What that means for triple net is that means um, any overall building costs like the taxes, outdoor lighting, snow plowing, um, those costs get divided amongst your square foot that you rent. So that came in at roughly about a dollar eighty three per square foot. So roughly around a little over ten dollars a square foot for warehouse space, which is um, pretty much the going rate. If anything, it's a little better than the going rate. So that would give us a, um, a lease cost of 579,569 the first year. And then it's a five year contract. That's something we went before the city council to get permission. Anything over three years, we need city council approval. This would be a five year deal. Um, they have a 3% escalation clause in here. So the rent goes up by 3% each year for those five years. Um, it's usually we would just go right from bid review to school committee with this, but where this is basically locking us in now for a five-year lease, um, I felt that it's something that should go before this committee so we realize that once we're in on this warehouse, we're in there for a while. So the hopes is down the line that, um, you know, the city can either acquire a property or um, maybe convert a property that we could build a, a real full city warehouse, something, you know, um, much larger than this, on a larger scale that we could use, DPW, Parks Department, everyone. But until then, we've got, um, you know, uh, need, since we lost the Cochrane building of a larger warehouse. What we have on <clears throat> Foster Street is okay for some of the day-to-day -day stuff, 
We're renting temporary space right now on Perkins Street that we would uh, vacate. That lease, we, I had set that up so that was every six months that renews so we can um, um, get out of that lease in time. So I just wanted the committee to have the opportunity to discuss this before we um, enter into a, a, a five-year lease. Uh, we'll be sending the actual lease over to the city law department to review to make sure that um, you know, we're protected in the lease and that our our, um, our desires and our wants are in there. We're uh, you know in good shape. So while, with that happening, I wanted to come here to finance committee first. If it's approved, then we'll add it to our budget. You know this year and then going forward, kind of like when we lease the laptop computers, we made a commitment that we were going to pay that lease for a number of years. Same thing would happen here. So, um, you know, with that, if there's any questions about the warehouse, the warehouse space, how we utilize it. Um, I have a few, and then obviously we'll let the <coughs> members of the committee um, ask their questions as well. Did you, if I understood you right, you wanted to come and obviously because of the length of the lease, get it approved by finance as well. Um, but also then the next step would be to go before, do we need to go before the city council as well? Did I catch that? No, we did went to the city council first to get permission to do a five year lease and they gave us permission. So, all right, that's already been so done. So that part's done. Right. What's left here would be to send a lease agreement to the law office. Okay. So that our, our lawyers can review it. All right, I didn't realize we'd already. Okay, and the other thing I was wondering, um, so we would give up Perkins, um, would we also, would we still retain Foster or do we not need it? For, for right now, we'd retain it. Okay. We, we do need it right now um, with deciding Even whether with to move. space? Aside from this space, we'd, we'd, we would probably use Foster for all of our technology. We have a lot now that we're using with laptop computers and whatnot. We'd probably move for the, the operations there of technology and use this main warehouse as a warehouse and a bus depot. Okay. Um, and I drove by the location just to get a, you know, right there, physical view of it. Um, and so we'd have the buses there. Um, would this also be where we would repair buses when they need repair? And, yes. and the, I couldn't tell because, again, I, don't, I didn't pull out a tape measure and start measuring. But sure. um, I did see there were, you know, some garage doors. I mean, are those high enough or are we going to have to do anything to the building? Uh, the, the building should be fine. I think the garage doors are high enough. Um, if we needed to make a modification, we'd talk to the owner about it. We have our own masons and whatnot if we needed to change something on it. But the buses we're buying a, a brand new. Other than changing the oil, looking at the brakes, I don't anticipate anything for the first few years right. on that. Right. So, okay. And there is a tenant on the other side of the building that has a very small spot. They've got larger doors on that side and okay. uh, more capability. So. Um, I think they only have less than a year left on their lease anyways. Okay. So we'd have the, if we needed, we'd have the ability to expand. Right. Right. I mean, we shouldn't have anything major that we'd have to pull it in, take it apart. But exactly. I, I guess my concern was just us having a place where we could if we needed to, because I know they're brand new, but stuff happens. Right. You know. Um, I'll have uh, Dr. Cobbs confirm that. He, he's been out there a few times, but I'll have him confirm. Right. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's all, all I had. Mr. Minichello, did I see you? Yes. Um, <clears throat> with the um, anticipated cost for um, the warehouse lease, would that be coming from uh, non-net school spending? Or? Most of it will come from non-net because it's part of the bus transportation. And since we will be using it for um, some of our school department costs, we will also use some net school spending. For that so um, probably like three quarters of it will come from the non net and the rest will come from school department okay so and so the the portion that would be coming from net school spending what would that be spent on what would, what would that what would those allocations be we'll, we'll do an allocation by, by square foot how much of the square footage we're using for storage of, of school records for storage of school supplies mm -hmm. um, kind of like we do with Foster Street right now so we'll, you know, if it's, if it's one quarter of the facility, then we'll charge one quarter of it to net school spending. And do you see any issue with regard to having enough um, <clears throat> funding in our budget in order to afford this type of a, an investment, a five-year investment? I don't see, I don't anticipate any problem. We, the buses are always um, a cost that we have. And the fact that 
we're only doing a small portion on the net school spending side. We are spending money right now for, for, for Perkins Street, um, and we're also um, you know, using uh, areas within schools that we'd like to clear out and be able to have free to use. But I don't anticipate any problem with the budget. Um, you know, the, the fact that we are now are being receiving the Student Opportunity Act funds to help our budget, and the fact that um, our budget from the state is finally seems like it's going to be um, on its trajectory to continue going forward with at least an uh, inflation increase each year. Um, the um the warehouse uh, with the old um, the bake what was it Nissan Bakery or what, which street is that one? The warehouse. Oh, that's Foster. That's Foster. Oh, okay. So we would still be utilizing that space. Yes. In addition to. Okay. And um, how long is our lease for that warehouse? Just curious. That's a th that's a three year lease. Every three years it, it comes up. Um, we have I think one more year left in that lease. Right now. Okay. Um, and the uh, the amount of space that you, you obviously need, um, uh, both both facilities are necessary for um, Foster Street as well as a new site. For right now, yes. Just at least for an additional year, and then we can reevaluate Foster. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so Aldo, is can more of the savings for buses pay for this? Well, the savings for buses and all of this is all combined in one budget. Yeah. So I've already um, calculated that we'll have at least for this year coming a six hundred fifty thousand dollars savings um, in the overall budget, and that's with this warehouse included in there. So. Um, yeah, I just would rather see more of the non-net budget pay for this lease. More of the non-net. Well, yes, most of it is. You know, it would be my. It would be less than a hundred thousand, I think, of net school spending that will go into it, but we're spending about that amount on Perkins already. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's why it'll it'll balance out. I was just following up, and I think we're all the three of us are kind of going in the same direction here. Is this rent? It, you had showed us kind of the projections, right? Of if we bought this many buses and so on, and what the expenses would be. Correct. Is this in line with the projections that you that you had shown yes. us and, and, and predicted? Yes. And and as we move forward and, and hopefully purchase the rest of the buses, we don't need an, another facility. This will handle it all. That's an important detail. No. Good. Yes. Good. Can now. Is it a five? Is it we were locked in for five years or the one year options? It's locked in for five years. We we uh, talked to the many different um, real estate agencies out there, and no one with a warehouse space like this wanted anything less than that. They wanted seven to ten. I said we wouldn't go there. No. So we we tried to do a, a year to year, and no one would no one would lease to us if we did year to year. All right. All right. Tom, did you have a follow up? Well, I mean, this really in my opinion is a capital investment because yep. you know this is not um, you know this is not teaching and learning per se this is sort of brick and mortar and building to store the necessities of running a school system you know um, so I mean this is something that is in my opinion the majority of it is is non net a non net investment mm -hmm. that um, is the responsibility of the municipality you know whether it be a town or whether it be a city and so um, you know, this is sort of, you know, this is basically, you know, the brick and mortar investment of, you know, housing, you know, in this case, it's, you know, goods and supplies and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not per se students, but, um, you know, if we, if the city could afford, you know, to uh, you know, build something, then, then that would be a different story. But, you know, this is, this is one way of being able to, you know, function in, you know, day-to-day -day operations that are necessary in order to, uh, you know, manage a, a school system with 20-some-odd Buildings, you know, and and and, and uh, you know, fifteen to seventeen thousand kids every, you know, so, so again, this this is not something that I, I think that you know legally we can take the majority and use not um, use net school spending. So, we just need to make sure that um, right. before we um, sign, you know, a five-year lease, that uh, this is a an expenditure that. Um, 
will be able to be funded through you know the majority funded through city uh, city city funds as opposed to state funds you know correct so and, okay. and that is that is the plan okay. that the majority will come from non net school spending funds so um, again we're going to house some staff in there some facility staff you know working that part of the operations so it's no different than um, any other business operation we would set up for the school department somewhere mm -hmm. I mean I understand this is the plan but we got to make sure that the allocation will be will be there you know for yes it, so okay well I'll be making the allocation so that's okay. how it is right. and I mean we from do the city from the city right. side you know okay and we do have a request into the city on the city's capital plan okay. for a major warehouse for the city and I've spoken with the DPW director and the two of us felt that we could share a very large building with a workshop in the middle um, that would house everything the city needs and everything we would need, but you now have to find a, a location, a piece of land. There, honestly, there aren't many buildings available in the city for this purpose, um, and when they do come up, they're gone. Um, the ambulance company took a nice one on Main Street. Um, I think W.B. Mason's just bought um, the old web company on Main Street, mm -hmm. you know, right off of Main Street. Um, there aren't many of these facilities, so um, the city is looking for either a vacant piece of land or something that would benefit us, but at this point that could be years out we don't know so Aldo what was the savings again for the bus well obviously we need we need this because we're opening pretty much we're we're getting into the transportation business yes. we've already made that decision and exactly to, we're going to end up purchasing about 60 almost 70 vehicles and there's currently we need this to operate a new transportation company which exactly. we, the Brockton Public Schools is going to run um, in the savings you said in the first year about six hundred fifty thousand and that's with this where that's with this warehouse. that's all of it yes I all right, so it. I'd just I'd like to figure out that we want to work towards that that's where all the money's coming from too because you know I just don't want to be in a situation where we were the we were the biggest mouths on the student opportunity act funding and then the state coming back at us say well now using some of that money to lease a warehouse and I understand it's going to be there's going to be toilet paper and paper towels and things that we run a school system for but I'd rather even so use whatever we're saving in buses to fund this fu fully fund this warehouse every year okay well I can make that allocation on the budget and then it is what it is I can just say we're not gonna um, we're not gonna charge a cost to the net school spending side Especially where we're still keeping Foster Street. I mean, if we were making this our sole warehouse space, again, I think that a stronger argument could be made to say, well, we had a warehouse paid out of, out of, um, you know, net. net. We're going to just keep that allocation. But um, so I was also, well, you know what? Before I do that, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to uh, to weigh in. So, Mr. Sullivan, did you have anything? Yes, <clears throat> Aldo. Do you know what the rents are now that we pay for Perkins Ave, <clears throat> the Cochran building? And um, I don't know the, the square foot. I know that the Perkins Ave is about 110,000 a year, and um, Foster Street is around 75 to 78,000 a year. <clears throat> yeah, so Foster Street 350 a square foot. Yeah, that we pay, and the reason why we wanted to hold on to that for the technology piece because you're going to be opening a transportation company. We know from my previous experience with technology coming in, in and out of the system, um, with how much we take in for deliveries of all our technology, how expensive th those items are, um, to, we were gonna keep that at Foster Street and not combine that with where we're gonna be running a transportation company. I just felt it was best to mm -hmm. have all those deliveries come through one place um, because there has been years past where some of those items got lost and we had to you know, go through a major overhaul in how we inventory and so having technology equipment now that we're a one-to-one -one district come in and out of one location without better control better, and then which we do now because um, everything does come into foster through a technology it's just now you're going to go into a big warehouse <laughs> You're going to have all the school supplies there. Now you're going to have all... A lot more know, traffic. A lot more traffic with 70 vehicles 
you know, coming in and out. I just think it's best to mm-hmm. at least for a year to see how it works to keep, I mean, for 350 a square foot, I mean, I don't think there's any other warehouse space right. we're getting for that. And this warehouse is wide open. There's no cages built yet. There's no shelving in there yet. Mm-hmm. So as I've been saying, it would be wide open. So, All right. Okay. Mr. Sullivan. One more thing, Aldo. The, uh, when we were leasing, well, we put out for, to get a lease on Clauser Street, Joyce was talking about buying that building at one time. And I'm looking at this and say, this is half a million dollars a year for rent? Yes. What the heck would a building like that cost to buy? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think they paid years ago six or seven million for this building. So um, it, it would be, again, close, probably closer to $10 million. Yeah. It's a very large piece of land. Um, the, it's set up for offices in the front of the building. There are large doors, the warehouse in the back. So, um, but at, at some point in time, when the city's, you know, either found a location or has acquired a location, then we can talk about building an even larger building that will house everyone. So, as uh, maybe because I'm getting older, but five years goes by fast. <laughs> <laughs> Just one final question: How much sure. land is there with that building? How much land? Yeah, is it one acre, two acres? It's probably and closer to three acres. In the bid proposal, we said it had to be able to handle 150 vehicles in the parking lot, okay. you know, the size of a bus. So that's what it has in the parking lot. It's very, very large. So it's three acres, roughly? I think it's at least three. It might even be closer to four. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, did you have anything? My my assessment on this, I think we need to look at you know long term, actually owning our own property. Mm-hmm. Uh, cost savings is is, is huge. Um, but right now, I mean, we have to do what we have to do to make this work. But I think uh, I'm not sure if the mayor can shine in if you know Mr. Rob May can um, assist us in trying to locate some type of property in the city since he's a city planner to make sure this moves forward. A point of information. So um, we are in discussions. I can't disclose too much of a, a much larger acreage facility that the city could potentially reacquire. We're doing our due diligence relative to contaminations, make sure 21E violations are all cleaned up. Um, and if and when we get to that point, uh, I think it would be so large that it would accommodate this. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're not going to dot the I's and cross the T's until we know that it's a clean piece of property. But thank you. It, I concur with you, Tony, 100%. Thank you. And I, and I think getting to that point, acquiring it, bonding it, do, the whole process of getting a structure built would be, I imagine, a few years out anyway. So we're going to need something, mm-hmm. you know, in the short term. Um, let's see. I know, um, Mrs. Mendez, I can't see you, so I want to at least see if you want to comment. Um, no, I don't have any comments, but can you guys talk on the mic? Because I can't really hear some of you guys. Oh. If you don't mind turning on your mics. You got it. Is this? Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right. Um, so then the other question that I had, and it kind of ties in with just this whole issue, maybe not necessarily this building, but we got Perkins because, again, obviously with COVID, we had to swap out the type of furniture we were using. Yes. And when things go back to normal, I'm assuming that we would take some of the setups we had before, tables and chairs around tables, that group type of work that was in classrooms before, we would put that stuff back. What are we doing with the stuff that's in classrooms now that, you know, is the traditional rows of desks and, you know what I mean? Where would we put that if we don't have... It would be there. It would fit, would it, it could oh, go here? Oh, yeah. Ex- exactly. Okay, that's I. So we're getting rid of Perkins because we have enough room to accommodate all that stuff. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, any other question or comment on this matter? <clears throat> so, Aldo, you you're looking for a motion Just of some a motion, kind? a favorable motion to send it to the, <laughs> to the full, full committee. committee for approval. And I just, Mr. Jagasin, I want to recommend. Oh, so, Cynthia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just a recommendation when we make the when you make the motion to 
um, that the allocation yearly would come out of the non-net budget, the full allocation. Okay. I mean, if that's agreeable to the committee. Works for me. I mean, you know, the, the whole reason we're getting this space is because we're going into the transportation business, as you put it. So um, if we weren't doing that, we wouldn't need this. Um, so uh, does anyone want to make a, a motion and, and make sure that they include the that the allocation come from non-net? I'll make a motion if you'd like. By all means, please. I'd like to move this warehouse space favorably to the full school committee and to add your part in, Mike, the full allocation to come out of the non-net spending of the school department. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Minicello. I'll call the roll. No, well, that's not an adjourn. Okay, Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Vice Chairs, yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. All right, so moved unanimous. I believe. Oh, now I covered up my agenda and paper. All right. So the next item on the agenda is expenses for moving the Keith School. Uh, Superintendent, is that you or Aldo? Um, I'll take it. Okay. Um, so, as you know, the um, the city is um, closing in on um, the current Keith School, which is obviously the old Brockton High School, as a possible site. Uh, for the new public safety building. So um, the two schools at the Keith, the Champion High School, the Frederick Douglass Academy, and then the Pathway Center that are located at that school, uh, we would need to relocate. Um, so myself, the mayor, uh, Mr. D'Agostino, have been looking at options across the city. Um, we are closing in on a location that obviously would have to go out to RFP. Um, but we obviously want to discuss the expenses of, of obviously we'd have to either buy or lease a piece of property, um, a, a building that would house um, about 200 students uh, that has a gym um, cafeteria. So we've been working on that. I just, we just wanted to bring it to discussion tonight because this will start to heat up um, as the city continues planning the new public safety building. and. Can let the mayor jump in and give us a timeline but uh, we have been looking um, we have some pretty good spots we've seen but again it does have to go out to RFP and um, we just wanted to be clear how you know that will go out uh, where the expenses will come from when we actually find a location for the where the key school is going to go yeah th thank you mr. chairman thank you mr. superintendent so every Monday at 10 o'clock we have a, a group zoom uh, and it's myself, uh, it's personnel from IT, personnel from um, BEMA, personnel from police, personnel from fire, and then we have school representatives as well, which is Dr. Jim Cobbs and Principal uh, Cynthia Burns from, uh, from the Keith Center, along with the, uh, the contractors and the consultants and the architects that we've already engaged to, to do the due diligence. One thing that all of us have agreed um, on that, and, oh, and the council president and Shirley Azak, the former president, on is, is on as well, uh, and law department. One thing that we've agreed is that we need to find a location uh, that exceeds the needs of the staff and the students. Um, and as the superintendent said, we've been working diligently with um, Dr. Cobbs uh, and also Ken Thompson to try to find locations. Uh, we've done site visits. Um, we've found one uh, that may um, may be able to meet all of the needs and then some. Um, we've walked it. We've talked to the principal owners. Um, we are having a, uh, a public meeting on uh, the 25th of this month, which is a Thursday, uh, for the general public relative to the public safety building. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that I had made a promise to do, and we, we will do that. Um, but in terms of finding a location, um, Mike and I and, and Mark are, uh, are committed to finding something uh, that is going to be, uh, as Cindy Burns said, better than what we have. And uh, I, I, I believe that we will achieve that goal. Um, the one that we looked at the other day uh, I thought was awesome. 
Um, you know, if we can acquire it, great. If we can lease to buy, great. Um, you know, within a, a set budget. So I just want everybody to know that, you know, some people have said, well, why, why are you ripping down the school and forgetting about the kids? We are never going to forget the kids. We're never going to forget the staff. Matter of fact, that's our priority. Um, and we'll continue to do that and report back to the to school committee until we find that location within the confines of the city of Brockton. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have, I mean, I know we haven't nailed down a location yet, so I don't think it makes sense to get into the nitty gritties of what that would look like um, specific location or the finances of, of that, but the moving expenses of, you know, packing the school up, getting it over to any new location. Do we have any numbers on that at this point? Yeah, so basically it's, it's, um, it'd be overtime for custodians. Um, it would be, and I'm just going off my um, knowledge, when we moved to Gilmore School, mm -hmm. um, we moved the Gilmore um, over to the Barrett Russell, and then we moved the um, Huntington over to the Gilmore, and then we moved the Goddard into the Huntington. Um, three years ago, mm -hmm. so um, just going off the expenses, then it's it's ten hours uh, in overtime, in, in additional pay for teachers at their hourly rate to five hours to pack up classrooms and materials, and five hours to unpack. Um, that usually would run. Um, there's probably about twenty five, thirty teachers there. Um, 10 hours each at right now the hourly wage is about $36 an hour um, then you would have custodian you're probably looking at about uh, a total of about I would say about 30 hours of overtime for about 20 custodians travelers to, to do the moving of everything so um, we're looking probably around probably around $50,000 total not bad. For moving. Okay. Because we do it all in house. We don't hire, obviously, moving companies. And right. um, we have plenty of furniture because <laughs> of the COVID money. So mm -hmm. we don't have to buy any furniture at all. Um, that wouldn't be a problem. There would be probably about, I would say, there could be close to 100000 in um, technology set up um the overhead projectors uh the whiteboards interactive boards um making sure our wi-fi was all set up uh, i know that they have a good setup there but then switching it over there's probably about a hundred thousand dollars in technology cost right. and i would say probably sh maybe twenty five thousand in any modifications we had to do painting uh, there's a couple walls that we would have to, you know, just different things would have to do to a building right. that would, you know, any Always building we stuff. go into. Yeah. So right. safety, security. Yeah. Safety, right. security, doors, fobs. Yep. Bringing um, a far fiber to the building. Mm -hmm. So there's our, our fiber loop is connected for all of our networking purposes, uh, phone system. Yeah. So it probably close, but I'd, I'd ballpark it about $200,000. For everything, soup to nuts. That's moving, that's setting up the technology, uh, furniture we already have, um, and, 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 you know, the security as well, the fobs, um, the cameras. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And I know it's hard to project that until we have the actual location and know exactly yeah. what it needs, but <clears throat> at least if we can, you know, kind of have some kind of a theoretical conversation about what that might look like. Uh, any members of the committee want to have, you know, comment or question on, on this? Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Just a comment. Well, and a question, too. As far as the new building you're looking at, can you say what's going on or where you're looking? Or is that a secret? Oh, Mayor yeah, Lawyer. I, I, I don't think uh, I would disclose the, the most recent one because we've only had one initial meeting at City Hall with the, the, the three owners. And they haven't even come back to us to say if they'd be willing to give a lease to own. Mike and I made it clear that um, wherever we go, we want it to be an ultimate city asset. If we can't buy it outright, uh, we want to be able to acquire it. We're not interested in doing a long-term lease for a public education facility. Um, I, I can tell you that um, 
it's a lot larger than anything that we have looked at over the last few months, this location. And um, yeah. I really, I won't, I won't disclose the address, not because I don't want to. I just think that it could hurt our, our bargaining position when we uh, get to the table with these people. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Anything else? No. All right. Anyone, I think Mr. Manicello, I saw you. Yeah, what are we talking about for um, a, a schedule in terms of dates regarding this project and uh, I guess the start of work over at the, um, the Keith? So the architects would like to um, hopefully start in, in September uh, if the location is, 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 is bona fide by that time. Um, the other, the other thing is we would rather not have the boys and girls um, go one institution for the first semester and then switch over to another one. If we have to, we will, but that's not our preference. So um, the location we're looking at right now does have a tenant um, that will be vacating. Uh, and that's another thing that um, the three business owners said that they would get back to us on. They wanted to check to see if those people could leave earlier. They weren't sure, and that was last Wednesday. Uh, we have another meeting next Wednesday with these folks. Uh, but in a perfect world, we'd be able to get everything squared away, uh, Mr. Mancello, so that um, we could start the process and that the boys and girls and the staff would enter into a, a new Keith Center um, in September. But it's fluid. I mean, it, it might not be till January. So would the project be pushed out until the kids are relocated, I guess, is my question. Yes. Okay, so, so they won't be disrupted. So we're not going to be moving these kids twice they'll be moved once right one yes. trend okay yes um all right so that's that's good and um and with regard to the you know related uh some somewhere in the range of 150 and 250 of cost is that going to be that's i assume it's not going to be borne by the school system because the school system isn't the one that's causing this this is it should be tied into obviously this project or however but yeah the cfo indicated that he believes that the relocation costs will be covered under the bond authorization Cool. Bond authorization is $98 million. That's the maximum. We don't, we don't want to max it all out, but the interest rates right now are at two. Great. Okay. Now, now and what action is there, uh, I guess, that the school committee needs to? I think it would be best for the school committee basically to, the city has to put it on RFP, so should we start that process? Yeah, Mike, Mike Morris' uh, procurement officer is going to be starting that process. Okay. Um, you know, I don't believe that there'd be any need for any vote okay. right now. This was just educate and inform the status of where we are. And again, the, um, the public, it's not a public hearing. It's a public meeting is on the 25th uh, relative to the Keith Center location as a public safety. Um, but I don't think there's a need for any vote yet because it's premature. Yeah, we don't. Okay. There's too many details like a yep. location that we don't have yet that I think we'd need to, to do a vote. Anything else, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is certainly a good a good thing for the city. Certainly, it's uh, long overdue in terms of a public safety building that has um, uh, the latest and, and greatest in, in what law enforcement and uh, I, I assume the fire department's also going to be there, Mr. Mayor? There'll actually be four departments. There'll be BEMA, which right now is at the War Memorial. So Brockton Emergency Management, which has been awesome in COVID, will relocate there. IT will leave here. They'll leave the core. They will open up classrooms here at Brockton High. Uh, Bill Santos and his team will relocate, and there'll be police and fire as well. Great. I mean, it's certainly going to be a good investment for the city. I think it'll make uh, you know people uh, in the city proud of you know what we have in Brockton. But but you know at the same time we need to make sure that the transition is smooth for our students. So we'll work together with with the mayor and and, and the city side of things. But um, you know. Um, you know, we, we represent the schools, so until we're assured that those kids and, and that staff and that, uh, you know, delivery of services, education is going to be done, you know, organ in an organized, uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive and, uh, you know, well thought out way with uh, as little hiccup as possible, I mean, we're going to just have to be cautious about, you know, plowing forward without having our I's dotted and T's crossed, but we're certainly going to be good partners in this. But uh, you know, got to watch out for our budget and what our what the needs of our uh, our constituents, which are our parents, students, and you know staff, uh, expect from us, and, and not to have them, you know, <laughs> evicted <laughs> prematurely without having everything uh, you know anticipated for for a nice smooth transition in a facility that will uh, make everyone proud, both on the public safety side and on the school side. So. 
So with yeah. that said, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll cautiously go forward in, in, a, in a very reasonable manner. So. Yeah, as, and as you know, and the mayor had said, there were some people that had those concerns. And, and I think when we've done these you know, school moves in the past, we've always been very methodical, thoughtful about it. We're doing exactly what we normally do, going, looking at facilities. When we now, this is a little different because in the past it's been shifting around facilities we owned so we could just have the committee going and you know so we could have a little bit different process where this so this differs a little bit there um but uh but yeah i mean obviously you know we're as the school committee never going to do anything that is not advantageous for the students and and uh you know hopefully the goal here will be you know the city benefits from a, a great a greatly improved public safety complex and the students of the Keith Center benefit from a greatly improved school facility for them over where where they are now in a, in a, in a very old building that you know I mean considering its age it's you know and not, not bad but you know they they'll, they'll benefit again as we've always done as a school committee when we do this we make sure everybody is you know we vet these things and make sure that the students will come out ahead um, and we will follow that practice as we always have uh, in the past. Um, any other comment from members of the committee? And just for the record, um, I, I think this has been asked and answered before, but this is in no way is going to put a, um, a, a dent or a problem with regard to financing and moving forward with uh, a potential renovation of this, this facility, correct? Yeah, absolutely Separate. not. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's so so we're going to be doing bonded authorization for the rehab of Brockton High. Um, we've already got the bonded authorization in 98 million. Um, we're also going to be doing bonding authorization of 10 million for the pipes, the, the pipes that are 1880, 1890 pipes. Um, but it will not impact um, this. It will not impact our bond rating or any of that. And and Aldo and Troy Clarkson, CFO, uh, talk about this almost every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. All right. If that's all the comment on that, then um, we'll move to the next item, the FY 2022 school department budget. So we'll have um, Mr. Petronio, our CFO, is going to fill us in on where we are with sure. um, our um, Chapter 70 funding and <clears throat> some other additional funding <clears throat> first for the Student Opportunity Act, is, which is being funded this year, but also... Um, money through the federal government through the stimulus packages and um we're excited to figure you know the latest one how much will come to the city and the school department on the latest one which we won't know yet until it's actually passed but um we'll give you an update of where we are with uh, chapter 70 funding from the cherry sheet and then uh, additional funding that we receive from the federal government so what i've handed out tonight are two books I usually put this all in one book, but find that it's, you know, a lot of it is backup information and sort of lug it to every um, finance meeting is a lot of work. So the, the thicker book that I gave everyone tonight is a list school by school of all staff and some of our expenses at each school. So basically what it costs as a cost center to run each school. Um, again, like I said, that's kind of backup information. You've been through that before. Then I kind of summarized the, the real finances into the smaller book that I gave everyone today. So um, I know that we've got a, another meeting at 7, so I'll kind of go through this quickly. But this is kind of the, really the kickoff on our budget. I want to say um, this is probably the first time in, I would say, more than 10 years that I'm actually going to tell you there's money available to spend. Last year we did think there was because we received the Student Opportunity Act last year, but then a few weeks later, COVID hit and we lost it. I think we're ahead of the curve on that this time, so I, I feel very confident we will keep the Student, Op Student Opportunity Act funds. So in doing so, that's how I projected my budget. Um, if you flip into the first page in the, in the book, what I basically did, this is, a lot of this you'll see is informational. This is showing our budget all the way back to 2008. It has our student enrollment, our foundation budget and then the increase in the foundation so it shows you know as our enrollment grew you saw our funds grow you see some bad years that we had where things were stagnant the, the state was limited on funds they changed how they counted our students we lost uh, money those years um, and so finally at the very bottom FY 22 
Um, although we're down, as of October 1, over 400 students, you're still seeing on the foundation budget an increase of 22,800,000. So that's great. So what that basically is is the Student Opportunity Act is now recognizing um, m and mostly our low-income students in their calculation of next year's budget. So the governor in accounting for that has increased our Chapter 70 and has increased our foundation budget to make up for that. If you remember the, um, the, the arguments in the overall formula for Chapter 70 were special ed costs, health insurance costs, low-income costs, and English language learners. So they started trickling a little bit in last year, um, and then they added in for the low income, and that's what gave us about a $19 million increase last year. Then we lost it because of COVID. So now they're back in. Most of the funding is coming to us in low income, and they will be um, over the next six years or the next five years, because this is technically year two of a seven-year program, you will see more funds coming in to make up for our health insurance costs, to make up for our SPED costs. So hopefully this momentum has started, and it won't stop. Um, so that $22 million increase in foundation budget is basically reflecting the fact that you know, we have a, a, a student um, enrollment that needs to be properly funded, and so they're making their move towards it. The next page, if you flip over the next page, it says local aid estimates, and for us that's mainly Chapter 70. I carved out all the city's um, increases, so we can just focus on schools. And basically, like I said, Chapter 70 alone went up $21.3 um, our reimbursement for uh, charter schools actually went down from four and a half to 4.3, so we lost a little bit of money on reimbursement for charter schools. Um, part of that is because they, don't, they, don't, they still don't fully fund the formula for charter schools. We've also, um, the New Heights Charter, this is, I think, its year, its seventh year, it's finally at full capacity, so you won't see that capacity really increasing, but we lose a lot of funding that year that's happening. Um, school choice. Level funded, I've asked the Department of Ed to explain that. They're going to get back to me. I don't understand why, because I can't imagine our numbers are exactly the same. But that's not a large number anyways. And then on the, um, on the assessment side, the money they take away from us, so any of our children in Brockton that go to surrounding schools for school choice, uh, $1.7 million, didn't change too much from uh, prior years. But our charter school tuition, you see, went up 2.4 million. So we're up to 21.4 million is what is taken away from our budget, our budget for charter schools. Like I said, this is, the, I think, the final year that New Heights is in there. And I know that some of the other schools had increased seating capacity, so more students went and filled those seats. So overall, between Chapter 70 and our, our charter and choice fundings, we're up about 18.6 million. Usually on a good year, we're up four million, four and a half anyways. So the difference again is the Student Opportunity Act. The next five pages are all of our grant funds. And uh, as you can imagine, over the years, we've always had 17, 18, 19 million in grants. This year, because of all of the COVID situations, all of the funding coming from the federal government, we've got around $42 million in grants. So um, a lot of those are hmm? a lot of hard work from teachers, administrators, staff for actually writing all these grants and correct filing them, which is some of them were came to us automatically, obviously for funding through um, you know the stimulus. But a lot of these actually people went out and you know and we applied for after them, them applied for them, and you know I want to appreciate everybody's hard. Karen Watts. Um, and uh, Chris Correa, who spends a lot of time managing them. So um, we want to thank everybody for their hard work because, you know, that's a lot of money in grants. It's a, it's a lot. And um, what I was saying the other day was that, you know, we have to be careful FY23, FY24, because a lot of these will go away. So we have to be, we have to be prepared. Um, I'm not looking to put reoccurring costs in from these grants. I'm looking for a lot of one-time purchases. We've discussed curriculum. We've discussed um, modular classrooms for schools, improvements. So um, that's what you know, the superintendent and the executive team will be working on over the next few months as to how to balance these funds to use as little now as possible and push as much off for the future years um, to help us with that, what I call a cliff when all this money kind of drops off. The largest increase we just saw is at the very bottom of the first page, ESSER 2. That's 15.1 million. Those are the funds that will come through Title I. 
we got 4.1 million this year in, from Title I in additional funds, and now the federal government has come out with a 15.1 million. So we're going to look at that for I think curriculum, technology, um, you know, um, uh, some changes the superintendent is going to make to the system to help deal with the uh, the evaluation report from the Department of Ed, make the changes we need. Yeah, although, um, well, okay, we that that money again. This is the second statement. The four, the first four million was from the first from SR one, yeah, and this is SR two. This is SR two. Um, that can be used all the way to 2020, December of 23? That can be used till September of 23. September of 23. My hopes, okay. we, we've asked myself and some other uh, communities, we've asked if they can somehow see if they can push that out. But the federal government goes October to October. That's their uh, annual year, or ours is you know, July to July. So, so basically we can use it for, school, for our fiscal budget. We can basically use it to June 30th of 2023. No, we have to, my understanding is we have to expend it by September of 23. We're asking for them to increase that. But what I would do is. No, but my point is, like, is if we had to stick to the fiscal school year, it would be June 30th of 23. Right, but right now the federal but government you're is. You're saying September of 23. Of 23, that's what they're saying. Yeah, but that's June there. becomes, is June is before September. Oh, <laughs> so. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm thinking of the. <laughs> our end of our fiscal year. Yes, you can use it until June 23. My hopes is that July, August, September, we would tap into what's remaining of those funds first, okay. then go into our budget. I just to be clear that we're allowed to use it at least for, um, you know, the next two school two years. years. Next two, okay. yes. Yes, I'm sorry school about that. School fiscal years. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So the first page of grants is the, f the federal grants. The next page is state grants, um, primarily those from the Department of Ed. Other state grants are the ones that are, again, from the state, but not from the Department of Education. Um, then we have other federal, which is the Stop School Violence Grant, which we have underway. Um, that's through the police department and cops. And the last one is the private grants, um, which we receive a pretty good amount of money, a million two on those. So we've got some. Great grant funding coming in. It's making a lot of work for the grants office, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. Um, and we're gonna balance these out with um, what the grant allows to be charged to the grant and what the end dates are on the grant. Again, we'll use the grants first, and then we'll go to our local funds. So we make sure that we use up every bit of these grant dollars that we can. Um, I know sometimes people ask if they can charge certain things to them. If the grant doesn't allow it, we can't but we try and make sure we find everything we can charge them. We do, we use them all up. Great. So um, after those five pages, I just wanted to show you, this is chapter 70. You'll see a chart now that begins with Springfield and Brockton. I put about 10 pages in. So the increase in chapter 70 this year um, due to the Student Opportunity Act actually put Brockton in the number two spot in the state for the largest amount of funds received. Springfield got 23 million, Brockton got 21.3 million. And then every community going down the list, you'll see mostly the urbans at, at the beginning, but you'll see how the majority of the funds really went to the urbans and then it dwindles its way down to all the other communities. So I have friends in all the other districts. Some of them are mad at me because they think that we took all the funds, but we're, we're getting all the funds that we rightfully deserve. Um, you know, our students um, deserve these funds. They're by law supposed to give them to us and that's why um, we receive them. So. Um, hopefully each year when this list comes out, hopefully we'll be you know, close to the top every single time on the funding. So that's, again, we worked very hard um, to get these and I think we're all set. Although, not to interrupt, but you know, to, the, to those who are not in urban too, and I've heard that comment before, right? The cities get all the money. The cities also usually have all of the high need students the uh, a disproportionately large amount of homeless and lower income students. Yeah, and so we get large amounts of funding for a reason, yes. you know, and, and obviously we know that, but, and, and I think they know that too, the, the towns that, that say things like that, they obviously are well aware of why we get the funding that we get, um, you know, but, uh, it, it, it's it's certainly because the the need is there and well proven, you know. Exactly, exactly. 
So the next page, what I included in is, this is what I wait for every year. The, usually the day after the governor's budget comes out, you'll see the Chapter 70 summary. So it's the page with the graph on the front of it, if you'll have in front of you. And what this does is this breaks out all of our costs. Our foundation budget, our Chapter 70, it shows the city's contribution that's necessary. So this is what Troy Clarkson and I work off of to develop the overall budget for the school department because it dictates how much the city has to put in uh, in order for us to meet net school spending. So um, it shows FY21, FY22, the increases and changes. Um, so basically the city's portion has to go up by a million for this year from last year, which you know health insurance costs going up each year alone um, usually make up that difference. So the city's never in a spot where um, they're overly burdened. It really happens because of the cost of the health insurance. So um, again, those are calculations. It shows the chart. and. Hopefully, like I said, the next five years going forward, we'll keep seeing that large increase that is owed to us. Um, back when the Student Opportunity Act was first discussed, they had said that Brockton was owed somewhere between 70 and 100 million over seven years. So, um, looks like we're on the path, and hopefully, they stay on the path for that. You know, it's the 70 million that they've been taking from us for the last 10 years. But, you know, thanks, guys. <laughs> sure. So the, ne the next page. This is, I put two reports together last year and this year. This is, I, this is the per pupil cost. So everybody talks about what's your per, per pupil and it's a blended rate. So this year we're getting, we're getting $13,567 per student on average. And FY22, because of the Student Opportunity Act, we're getting 15219 All the data you see in the chart above breaks it out by grade level and by area um, within the budget of how the state formula calculates our budget. This is the whole Chapter 70 formula, and that's how it calculates for every district. I highlighted in light blue in the upper right and the bottom right the low income number. That's the number that really brings us in a, a large amount of money. You'll see um, on the top of the chart, the total of that column is 74 million, 74.4 million whereas this year it's 52.6. So that's the Student Opportunity Act changing the formula, bringing us in you know, close to $20 million um, because of the low income factor in our district. Now the numbers have gone down as far as the number of low income students, primarily because we're losing some enrollment. They're going to charter, they're going to other schools. So that's a number that, although it's gone down, it hasn't gone down proportionally the same as our enrollment. Um, we're hoping that number goes back up as we um, identify more students. We have uh, Janice Johnson Plumer, who is our outreach specialist. She gets families who need help with uh, getting on SNAP and state benefits. She, she reaches out to them. She works with them. You know, a lot of them don't know how to do the uh, application and whatnot. She does it for them. She'll go to their homes, well, before COVID. She'll talk to them on the phone. Um, Brockton, believe it or not, was the first school district to be linked in with SNAP, that we actually have our own uh, module that we go in and, and, and help families get logged in on. Other districts have now jumped on that. I think Chelsea and Revere and others are, have asked how we did it and we connected them with the state. The state loves it too because now they're taking that work you know, kind of out of their office in Boston and they're spreading out to the communities. So Janice works literally five days a week, morning, noon, and night, getting people signed up on this. Um, a lot of people don't understand that you could have two part-time jobs and still be, um, still be approved for SNAP. You might not get a large dollar amount each week, but you'll still be approved. Once you're approved, that student then is counted for us as one of these students, and we get our, our reimbursements, both federal and state, for having that student right. on there. So again, that's informational. It's for those of us that like numbers, it's nice to look at and see Costco. The next page is our enrollment report. I've been here, Aldo. Sure. Um, so if you look at some of the districts um, close to us, uh, Taunton, Fall River, New Bedford, and I, I work with those superintendents, and um, a lot of their Student Opportunity Act money was eaten up by their loss of enrollment. Um, so a lot of superintendents thought that maybe the state would put kind of a plot hole fund together for the loss of enrollment, because every district has lost enrollment due to COVID. Um, luckily, um, well, first of all, not unluckily, they didn't they didn't put any pothole funds in for loss of enrollment. So a lot of those districts, they lost a lot of kids, and they lost those kids before October first. Luckily, 
we did have a loss October for, for, um, October 1st, but it was only, um, not only, but it was 406 students on October, October 1 of 2020. Now we have to date on the March 1st enrollment report, we are down 889 students. So the reason I was, we were, I wanted the details on how, how long we have to spend that 15 million in the ESSER two funds is because we have to try to conserve a lot of that money to brace ourselves for ne next October. Now we're gonna do everything we can to try to get these students back. Jess Hodges is working on a campaign. Um, the, the silver lining is that um, 408 of these students are um, in our elementary schools. So a lot of those I believe are uh, parents who didn't wanna send their kids to kindergarten during a pandemic. Some people um, kept those kids home we're hoping we're going to recapture them when we get, you know, pretty much back to normal as we move into September. Um, so I'm hoping that's one silver lining in the number of kids we lost because most of the kids we've lost out of the 889, 408 are from from our elementary. So we hope to get those kids back. But my point is, if the state doesn't put anything in next year, and we go into if we end up losing 889 students, if that's the same number we stick with on October 1st of this year, 21, that 15 million that we have pretty much in the bank is going to be needed, so we can save the district over the next couple of years for any loss. It's just to brace ourselves for the loss of, right. you know, disenrollment because they did not fund the districts that lost a lot of kids they did they they went with your enrollment because it was talk of go using last year's right there there was talk of using october 1st 16, of 19 of, nine, right. of 2019 they did not do that so maybe the house and senate will do something with that we don't know but i just think you know as a committee um and us working together and you know, obviously with the mayor's office, it's important for us to know that that 15 million, we need to be careful. Because yeah. we're down almost 900 students, and if that sticks October 1st of this year, you know, we need to make sure we are ready for that and to stabilize the school district. Well, and I would say we need to be careful in general, too, even with the, even with the SOA money that, that's come in. That was supposed to come in last year. The pandemic hit. We didn't get it. You know, and we don't know what's around the corner for what the state finances are going to look like coming out of the pandemic, assuming that things continue as they are and we are coming out of it. Um, you know, so I think we, we just have to be cautious on that front, too, because if things are ugly enough, on the, you know, who knows? I'm just saying if things were to be ugly on the state side next year, maybe we don't get what we're expecting and we've, you know, made commitments. So. So I think we just have to be careful overall in this budget for, for the reason you just gave and also because we're still coming out of a, a pandemic and, and, you know, even, you know, the state doesn't know what kind of condition it's going to be in once this all shakes out. So, but, uh, you know, um, and I don't want to rush. This is obviously important. It's the beginning of the budget, but we are kind of holding up facilities from, from getting their meeting started. So, um, you know, I don't want to, I apologize to the members of the committee who might have questions, but for the public and the committee, if, if you look at the schedule, we are having finance every Tuesday um, through the spring until the budget is finally done. So I would say go through and, and you know, we can maybe just have less on the agenda for the next finance meeting and, and dig in a little further where we won't have other items. Uh, maybe the next finance meeting we can just stick to the budget for, for what, we, what we discussed. That way we can dig into this a little more. Um, and we won't be up against the clock if that works for everybody. So next Tuesday night at 5.30. And, and for the public, you'll see if we have a regular meeting, finance is at 5.30. If there's no regular meeting, finance is at 6. And so, you know, you'll see for the next several months we have that already set up. And also just, again, for the public, we will, um, uh, these budget documents presented tonight um, will be on uh, Brockton Public Schools um, website. Uh, we post them every year. We'll make sure that they're they're posted um, and easily uh, easy to read for um, 
that's a part, also part of our district review to make sure um, the public, general public can look at our budget documents and be able to decipher them easily. So um, Jess Hodges will put that together. On a, it'll be a tab, a button on our website um, for um, the FY22 budget where all these documents will be uploaded and people can see them there. Perfect. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you to Jess for her work in helping us do that and make that available to the public so that we have a very transparent and open budget process that, that the public feels they can understand and look at and, and, and you know, be a part of. So um, with that, I know we have other business. So I'll just ask real quick, any other business? Okay. Um, is there a motion to adjourn finance? Motion to adjourn finance. Second. We have a motion to adjourn by Mr. Sullivan, properly seconded by Mr. Minicello. I will call the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Vice Chair says yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Finance is adjourned. We'll take a very brief two minutes and go to facilities for those who are on facilities.